There are two types of preachers from what I've observed. Those who have a grasp of the message and others who have been grasped by the message. One who seems to be able to choose his sermons and others it appears whose sermons choose them. One who when he sees it realizes he better not say it. And the other one who says, now that I've seen it, I better say it. One who'll happily avoid saying the things that get them fired. And those whose very words often cast them into the fire. <laughs> Genesis 40 and 41, I realize both chapters combined presented a little bit of extra reading, but if thousands have given their lives to protect and preserve these words, surely we'll find little cause to complain about reading them. I mean, we'll still complain, obviously, because, well, yeah, we love to complain. I'm just saying we have little reason for it, that's all. The narrative, as you'll have witnessed, is Joseph's coronation, his passage back in from the wilderness and into his promised land, his resurrection from the pits of despair and death, his chaos finally being subdued by order and order from the highest location. The journey from his banishment from Potiphar's garden to, by comparison, being ruler over all the earth is somewhat complete. Chapter 41, verse 41, So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. All that's missing is the fatted calf. Did any of you read this without the parable of the prodigal son ringing in your ears? So it's the great reversal the exaltation of the humble, the last becoming first, the servant becoming master, the least becoming the greatest. Joseph, upon entering Pharaoh's service at age 30, reminding us again of someone else we've likened Joseph to on numerous occasions. Joseph, um, goes on to have bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, save Pharaoh's name itself. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders only with respect to the throne, while I be greater than you. And having had his clothes snatched away from him by his brothers and then snatched again by Potiphar's wife, Joseph would now find himself clothed with royal apparel. Joseph would rule seated at Pharaoh's right hand with all authority having been given to him while Potiphar and his wife and all other enemies he might have had now being placed under his feet. He who was, he who could be trusted with little was now being trusted with much. So, Joseph, still in prison, welcomes the arrival of two new inmates the cup bearer and the baker of Pharaoh, suggesting perhaps that Pharaoh had been poisoned by something he ate or drank, and they couldn't quite determine precisely where from. 
whatever it was they'd done, it, it was enough to land them in jail. Um, but that one is ultimately reinstated and the other executed, it appears they eventually discovered what had happened. Say what you like about the thief of the cross. Why else we're on the subject? <laughs> but he's, he's the luckiest man in history, right? When you've been found guilty and sentenced for execution, when you find the final hours of your life draining away faster than any second you'd ever experienced, and when death itself finds no real reason to mask its ugliness anymore and your mortality is visibly taunting you, when you practi practically have no time left, and even if you did, you're in no position to do anything with it, and yet you find yourself in that situation being crucified next to the Savior of the world in anyone's language, that's a lottery win. His friend at the other side of Jesus will eventually represent the world. Those lacking the good sense to see our salvation, even when it's stuck in the ground right beside us. And just like these two men at the cross, the cupbearer and the baker find themselves on either side of Jacob, uh, either side of Joseph, one headed toward life and the other headed toward death and execution and a lottery win. Joseph was only 17 when he first began meddling in the dream industry, when he first involved himself with predicting the future and fortune of others. And how had that worked out for him? How had interpreting dreams worked out for Joseph? How had being the one who was speaking for God, the one entrusted with carrying God's light to those in darkness, how had it all worked out for him? Joseph, the example of Joseph and people like him, is why we find so many cowards in life. I think we learn very quickly that our mouths can get us into all kinds of trouble. And consequently, people often pull back into our shells, set ourselves on a heading for social retreat, keep ourselves to ourselves, say nothing and move on. We find it to be the safest course of action. It's why the prophets... Jesus himself, the apostles, the early disciples, along with some social historical figures that we've come to know down through the ages. It's why they find such a treasured place in our hearts. We understand the risk that comes with speaking up. And we warm toward their courage. We understand that Safety is more guaranteed when our heads are below the parapet. It's why freedom is so often squandered away because fear is irresistible at times and it's allowed to reign. Freedom, freedom, they laughed and cried leaving Egypt and then begged to return to their vomit every time they felt threatened. As I've pointed out in the past, we can't have both. I wish we could, but we can't. Freedom isn't safe and safety isn't free. It all becomes a determination of what matters most to us. Freedom means leaving Egypt and embracing the wilderness, the unknown. Freedom means listening to the invisible voice. And those who'd rather be free and and embrace the risk that comes with it have always seemed rather strange to those who'd rather remain in Egypt or go back to Egypt. Sure, of course, it's slavery, but it's the devil we know. To those whose lives are solely governed by what others think about them, 
these vocal, outspoken, risk-taking individuals often appear stupid, insane even. Why would anyone ever say anything that would so obviously arouse others to think less of them? Jeremiah said in regard to God, if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. In Acts chapter 4, after being warned to shut their mouths, Peter and John said, yeah, well, yeah, you can judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God, but we cannot help speak about the things that we have seen and heard. So there are two reasons, two answers. Jeremiah said, because it burns me alive. And Peter says, yeah, sorry, not sorry. We can't help it. We know what you're asking. We'd love to help, but we can't help because you're asking us to do something we can't help doing. You'd be as well asking us to fly. We can't fly. We can't fly and we can't not preach. We can't help it. Jeremiah also complained that he couldn't help it. He said, I'm ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. The only thing you've given me to preach is violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me reproach all day long. I'd love not to speak. It would mean less ridicule, less reproach, less mocking. People would think better thoughts about me. Or even if I had a different message, why can't I preach live your best life now? God's got this. Seven steps to a mission-minded Israel. The four pillars of Hebrew joy. God's got a plan for your life to bless you and not to... Why do I have to preach the coming judgment? No one likes that. So I'd love nothing better than to be quiet, but every time I do it, I'm on fire. There are two types of preachers from what I've observed. Those who have a grasp of the message and others who have been grasped by the message. One who seems to be able to choose his sermons and others, it appears, whose sermons choose them. One who, when he sees it, realizes he better not say it. And the other one who says, now that I've seen it, I better say it. One who'll happily avoid saying the things that get them fired. And those whose very words often cast them into the fire. So we have forgiven Joseph, who when upon hearing about the dreams of the cupbearer, and the baker, we'd have forgiven Joseph if he'd simply pulled the blanket back over his head and went back to sleep. We'd, forgiven, we'd have forgiven Joseph if he didn't ever want to hear about a dream ever again. But that's not what we find. Rather, we find Joseph, what's that? Someone mentioned a dream. <laughs> Dreams, you say? <laughs> I'm your man. <laughs> I'm telling you, these people can't help themselves. You can't shut them up. In fact, the people that I'm talking about, any move towards shutting them up only emboldens them further. It's fuel to their flame. To those who prefer hiding under the bed of life, that appears as insanity. But these people can't help themselves. I think, I think it comes from a clearer than average understanding of when all of this is over, I'm not going to be standing before you. So truth be told, as much as you, I love you, <laughs> I 
really, I couldn't give a hang about what you think. I'm not going to be giving an account of my life and what I said or didn't say to you. So up comes the cupbearer and tells Joseph his dream. And Joseph replies, ah, yeah, the three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore to you to your position and you will be Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to. Just The only thing I'm asking is that you show me some kindness, you remember me uh, and, you know, mention to Pharaoh about me, get me out of this place. And upon hearing this, the baker obviously thinks, oh, you beauty. Hey, Joseph, 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 I have a dream too. I have a dream too. <laughs> he tells Joseph, stands back, no doubt, eagerly anticipating the response. And Joseph says to the baker, ah, oh, yes. The three baskets, yeah, 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 three baskets, just like his three cut, yeah, yeah. The three baskets are three days, yeah, 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 three days, I heard that about, yeah, yeah, I know where it's gone. Within three days, Pharaoh, oh, yes, within three days, Pharaoh, yeah, I know, will lift up my head. No, no, will lift off your head. And hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat away your flesh. Um, you got any other interpretations in there? <laughs> oh, be careful what you ask. Now what follows are three days of excitement from the cupbearer, excited about the prospect of getting back into Pharaoh's good books, receiving a nice salary, spending time with his family again, and more than likely three days of denial from the baker. Stupid Hebrew, what would he know? If he had any standing at all, the last place he'd be is in here beside me in prison. Idiot, listening to him in the first place. Stupid shepherd. What do shepherds know? They don't even go to the right schools. They're out there wandering around. He kind of reminds me of someone else if that was a situation. You know, the rich young ruler, Jordy just preached on him. I think Billy preached on him recently. <laughs> He arrived all excited, didn't he? All prepped and primed to question Jesus. He had every qualification under the sun to warrant such an approach, wealth, youth, position, and by all accounts had meticulously paid close observance to the law. Until Jesus said, what's that under your saddle? What's that you buried under the oak tree? What's that you're hiding under your tent? Oh, that, oh, oh. I thought my youth, my position, my prestige would have blinded me. Would have blinded you to all of that. No, that's nothing. Don't tell me it's nothing. If there's one thing I'm fully qualified to recognize, it's the gods and you have one. Go get rid of it. And of course, off he went, disappointed. Poor fellow. Could probably spot and name every heathen god within a thousand miles. But his own? Unfortunately for the baker, this ignorant Hebrew is batting a hundred. He's bang on. The one favor Joseph asked was that the cupbearer remember him 
And then that goes flat. So when the next dream arrives, Jesus, Joseph's got even more ammunition to ignore it. More reason to ignore it. But not Joseph. What? What's that? Dreams, you say? Pharaoh's got a dream? Oh, man, give me a crack at it. Let me at it. Let me at it. <laughs> and that brings us back to where we started. Joseph's wilderness wandering is all but over with but a few loose ends to tie up when the famine eventually forces his family down into Egypt, which, if you don't mind me recognizing, is what the promised land is actually all about, the reuniting of the family of God. And when they arrive, and it truly is, the wilderness is over. The family is reunited. Thoughts, comments, questions. Thank you.